Bienvenidas a esta llamada. Estamos en el día 5. Ta. That's it for joining sleep. Welcome to the call. We're on day 5. That's what happens when you have meetings in Spanish and English at the same time. That's the way it goes. Thank you so much for being here. We're on day 5 of the funding week. And as usual, make sure that you can ask your questions right here where it says chat. I'm going to I already set it up. Uh, and you can send a question privately or publicly. I'll just send it to you privately. And uh, you can also join us on Facebook and LinkedIn and Pinterest and Google Plus. So today is a very exciting day because we're going to cover something that a lot of people are asking about, and it is where do I find the funders and where do I find the backers? So I hope you navigate it with us and you realize that the first thing that you need to do is be well prepared. The last thing you want to do is go and ask for funds where you're not prepared. That just shouldn't happen. Uh, right now, we're going to go and look at what are the options for funding. And we're going to go back to the slide that I showed yesterday, um, which shows the several options that you have. So you have Funding sources as founders, family, and friends, those are the three Fs. You have unfunding mechanisms, gifting, sponsors, partners, factoring, grants, and you have something else that I call disappearing. You also have crowdfunding, and you have angel investors, equity partners, venture capital funds, and corporate venture funds that are more uh, formal ways of investing in, term, in exchange of equity. You also have short-term and long-term debt, and you have a hybrid called convertible loans. We're not gonna talk about convertible loans because conver convertible loans traditionally are provided by the people that are above this slide, uh, angels, uh, equ equity partners in general, angels, venture capital funds, uh, and um, they have, it's a way of structuring the deal. So it's not a type of funding, it's just a way of structuring the deal that is a hybrid between uh, debt and equity. So we're not gonna talk about that. Um, we're gonna talk about the types of backers and funders and how do you find them. But let me start with the most important person here, which is you. You should be the first supporter and backer of your idea. A lot of people have written to me, how do I find people to believe in my idea if I don't have any money? Well, you don't have to have money to get money. That was old fashioned. What you have to have is passion and you have to have a way of proving to the people that you can turn your dreams into a reality. Not because what you say you can do is gonna happen, but because you're gonna put your effort into it. And because you're gonna take their advice to make the changes that are required. One of the things that I know is that if you have great ideas, chances are that those ideas are creative and uh, um, innovative. And you will not know exactly how it is that you're gonna do it. That's why they're great ideas, because they have not been tested. So in the process of moving there, you will have to make changes. Two years ago, I'm gonna move this. I'm gonna move this. Uh, yeah. And I am going to mute the participants. How do I do this? Here they are. I am gonna mute the participants. Good. Good. Because what I didn't know in this service is that every time somebody makes a noise, the video goes into their screen. So we, we had to re-record some of them sometimes. So apologize for not telling you that. Going back to the first backer, it has to be you. You have to know what you want to do and why it's important to you. And you have to be able to make the activities, to execute the activities. But what I was talking about was not being able to know 100% how are you gonna be able to achieve something or if you would need to change the focus of your intention. There was a study here two years ago 
on startups in Silicon Valley. And Silicon Valley is definitely the place where most startups um, get funded in the whole world. I've, I've been to over 100 countries and I lived in nine. And it has been uh, well researched. There's no place like Silicon Valley for the can do attitude. So it's not that people think about it, they do. And that, that is very interesting, but it's, it's just a very, very um, exciting place to be. Here, where most people are able or are, have the intention or actually execute their dreams, on average, each idea turns drastically into another idea 4.8 4 times in the first two years. So think about it. There's even a word for that. It's called pivoting. So pivoting is when you have a leverage point and you shift completely. And what is that leverage point? That is your passion. That is what a lot of people don't understand and they don't tell you. So you might say, I want to achieve this and this is my mission. And along the way, you realize that the best way to get there is not the way that you plan. There is another way. But you don't know which way it is until you start executing. So that is the paradigm, that is the circle. What we talked about yesterday was the major flaws that, uh, and how do you prevent and manage them. And what I said is that you need to manage expectations because what you're going to do is not exactly what you said you were going to do. It's a catch-22. When I lived in Chile, I started the first seed capital fund. And I realized then that if we were to pursue each individual business plan as a given, and if people were going to do exactly what they said that they were going to do, we were going to fail in all businesses. That was for sure we were going to fail. It happens that way. But I didn't know at that time, because I was very young and naive, that the best way to leverage that is to input the experience of others. And that way the collaboration became very important. I was able to do a lot of things because I welcome people's feedback and I was very attentive to how we can leverage on their intentions, their expertise, the support that we had, so we could both or the three of us or the four of us achieve what we wanted to achieve. And that's something I want you to think about. The plan that you have to execute your idea, if your idea is a great idea, it's very unlikely to happen. Why? Because in the process you will need to change because you don't know what you're gonna face. And you will not need to know, you will not be able to know how you need to change that until you take action. If you understand that, then it is better for you to find people that would help you accomplish what you want to do. So the first thing you need to understand is that you need to know what you want to do to find backers, but you also need to tell them, this is what I want to do, and it is very likely that I would have to change. If they cannot work with that level of uncertainty, you don't want them in your team. You don't want to be dealing with them because that can become a nightmare. They can come and participate later when you're more stable. But for this particular part of starting up a great idea, you want people who have the flexibility to help you rethink about what it is that you want to do so your risk re is reduced and you are more likely to achieve what you want to achieve. Let's go back to then, <clears throat> excuse me, how do you find backers or supporters? The first one has to be you. You have to show that you believe in your idea. Now, three or four years ago, I was doing a research paper on scientists, and I realized that there are two types of intentions. They are the dream intentions and they're the goal intentions. Dream intentions help you think widely and open up your mind and explore new things. It's creativity at large. Goal intentions help you focus and narrow your activities so you can accomplish something. You should not look for backers to support you if you're not willing to support yourself. 
that doesn't mean to put in money. It means to put the time to get things done. That's what it means. If you have money, you need to show that you put something of that. Uh, I always find very interesting when people don't want to lose their, don't want to leave their jobs because they want somebody to believe in them before they go and start a company. And I'm thinking, okay, how are you going to work? And they said, well, I'll start working when I get the, the investors. And I think, well, show me something because you can always work on, on a weekend or at night or something. Just show me that you've, you've done some part of it before you expect me to believe in you when you're not believing in your idea. You, I, I see some of you nodding, the ones that are online. So you really get that. And you, know, you don't wanna ask somebody to help you out if you're not willing to help yourself. Uh, you see that with so many things and so many people. So the first backer is you. Then we go into the other, what are the others backers? And this is finding investors and finding supporters or sponsors. It's like going up the stairs. So sometimes you can jump from the first level to the third or the fourth step, but chances are that you would get tired, you might fail and you might fail all the way back. So it's better to go one by one and then leverage on that step to go to the second one. If you're your first backer, then turn around and see who in your close circle would back you up. And as again, you don't necessarily need them to give you funds, they can give you resources. Think for example, who would like to help you out as an advisory board? That's one of the things that I suggest to many, many people. When you start thinking about your idea, get an advisory board, get with a group of people that can help you think things tr through. So you, the number of mistakes that you make is, is reduced, but also you have more creativity. These are people that should believe in your idea and should help you out because they have the time and they have some experience that would help you out. That's your advisory board. If you go to the Wealthing Institute, we have an advisory board. I set it up as soon as I got here and established and I found some people that could help me out. Some are here, some are not here. That advisory board is not necessarily only limited to your friends. Ask the people that you know, whom they know that might be interested in helping you. And get used to the idea that you will ask for help, not because you are in a diminished position, but because you are inspiring. Whenever you have doubts, I find it very useful to look, for example, at the videos of Mother Teresa. This is a person who was in not the nicest place of the world and asking people to go and fund her to help the people that nobody really cared for. And she was so inspired because she was so focused on her mission that she didn't care if people said no. She just, okay, let me look for somebody else. And that's exactly the same way that a lot of uh, great thinkers and visionaries get the things done. They, this is not for everybody. This is for few people because this is the early stages of great ideas. So make sure that you start asking people and accept that they don't necessarily have to buy into your idea to be able to help you. Okay? If somebody doesn't like your idea, ask them. Do you know anybody who might want to contribute? And what I have found that is very, very interesting is that the best help that I receive is not from my close friends. It's not from my strong ties. It is from my weak ties. I find great support in people I just met. This is amazing. People I just met are able to provide me with a lot of support and help because it is very, very liberating. And because of the weakness of the tie, if I don't like it, they don't lose my friendship. And if it works, it adds value to their lives. So it's this very interesting social construct where the people who are your friends are not necessarily the ones that help you out most because they're afraid that if their advice is not taken well, you're gonna get upset at them. Or 
they're afraid that they're going to lose your friendship or they're afraid that you're going to fail. So this is very contradictory to the theory. And make sure that then that you have a good message and you ask people, can you, do you know anybody that might be interested in this? This is what I'm doing. The other thing that I find is, is the um, a reluctancy of people to open doors for them. When I was, uh, when I was teaching in um, Australia, my students had to have an exercise where they had to interview an entrepreneur. And I challenged them to find an amazing person. And I told them, you need to be able to expand your envelope, reach for the stars. If you reach for the stars, that's where you hang out. Nowadays, you can look at people on LinkedIn and on Twitter. I, I wouldn't use Facebook because it's too private, but you can, go, you can look them up through Google+. Plus. Reach out for people that you think are amazing. Chances are those people will help you out if you meet two criteria. okay? You need to think big. That's why I did this course for great ideas. And you need to be authentic. Those are the two criteria. There is a lot of people that would give you a hand because success has many parents. We all know that. There is no way I could have become successful without the helps of others. So I, in turn, feel compelled to help others. Most angel investors do that because they want to help others. That's a paradigm break. It's not that we don't want to make money. We want to make money, but we don't want to make money unless we also help another person make their dreams come true. But we get a lot of people that are contacting us because they want to make money. If I want to make money, then I do something else. It's a combination of emotional and rational that drives most angel investors. It's a combination of inspiration and action that drives most personalized investments. And it's also the combination of the human, of the rational and emotional that drives lenders to believe in your idea and to tweak the processes that they can tweak to help you out. But you have to be authentic about that. It's not money. It's the impact that drives the world, especially if you have big ideas. So be the first backer of your idea. Find your friends and even your relative and ask them out. I have this idea. Who do you think would be interested in helping me out? And don't be surprised if they tell you, well, I wouldn't know. But ask them if they can provide with a reference. Because as I said, I find it, it is incredible that most weak ties are the ones that can help you out. And then go and start building that up. If you want to look for uh, lenders, lenders' debt is the cheapest source of funding. So people get upset because, oh, well, the interest, that's the cheapest one. The other ones are more expensive. And lenders don't share your benefits. So you, can, you know exactly how much it's going to cost you. Go and make the banker your supporter. I can't tell you how many times my bankers have supported me. Not be necessarily because they gave me money, but also because they put me in touch with other people that might help me. So just start building that network of people. Talk to your suppliers if you have suppliers. Talk to your colleagues if you have colleagues. If you are establishing a great idea within a corporation, what really works is to talk to people that are in different areas about how it would be possible to get your idea supported. When I work, I work for Bayer and Shell and I work for Sibagagi, two large companies, and I work at uh, universities as well. Those are my corporate and academic settings. And just realizing that I, I can only go so far if I'm going by myself and I need the support of others, that was a, a, a really good thing. And then knowing that my idea needs to be fertilized with somebody else's ideas was also very important. So try to find backers that would help you go from the first step to the second step to the third step to the fourth step instead of trying to find one backer that would make you jump from the first step 
to the third floor. That's where pe people don't really understand that. What about consultants? Consultants could be important and useful, provided that they can show you that they have been there, okay? Many consultants have very good intentions and very bad knowledge. And they can be providing you with the wrong advice, not because they want to damage you, of course. Consultants are great. But if they have not been there, chances are that they might not be able to help you out. And I see a lot of people having, hiring consultants to present a business plan or an idea on their behalf. And that contradicts the human nature of investing that, I, that I've been uh, speaking about throughout the whole course, which is that this is, this is a human process. I don't want to meet a consultant. I want to meet the people that is behind the idea. And the reason why the people, be, the reason why most people behind the great ideas don't go out is because they don't want to be rejected. Well, if you have a great idea, it will get rejected because we need to think about the paradigm that you're breaking. That's just, that's just part of the game. That's part of the fun. So um, when I see a lot of people in, in LinkedIn asking questions about rejection, rejection is good. Rejection means that you're breaking a paradigm. That's what it means. Go for it. The, the world cannot move if we're doing all the same. And, and we can move slowly by doing continuous improvement, but is, is it really worth doing it that way? And so accepting rejection is good because that means that you're breaking paradigms. Then let, I, want, I want to talk a little bit about crowdfunding because this is really when uh, this is really how what I just mentioned about the weak ties works at its best. If you've never used crowdfunding, I invite you to go to Kickstarter and Indiegogo. I'm going to put it here in the chat. Okay. Kickstarter, Indiegogo. So there, there are two um, great crowdfunding places. I invite you to go there and to explore the different campaigns. I personally have put in a little bit of money or a lot of money in different projects because I think it's very inspiring. Crowdfunding allows people from different parts of the world to get together in front of a lot of people and express their, their ideas to get funded. Now you will see in the great campaigns of Kickstarter and Indiegogo that some people have raised millions of dollars, millions of dollars. What you don't see is that most of these campaigns were run after running several campaigns that did not succeed. Okay, so you remember what I told you that you take step by step, that's what really you have to do. So some people say, done, I'm going to go and run a campaign, I'm going to ask my 15 friends come and back me up, so other people's things that are very important. So they set up a campaign, actually one of the companies that I invested did that, and I thought it was very funny because I thought, oh my gosh, I didn't think about this. So they start a campaign, they talk to the friends, they have 15 backers the first two days, and they think everybody's going to go and say, well, you know, these have 15 backers, I'm going to back them up. And they, they don't have anybody else. And then they have some friends that come and say, I'm going to put $500. And, and you know, you have these peaks. And in reality, that's not the way it works. It works because people are engaged and because people go slowly and slowly adding that to your campaign. So if you're going to go to crowdfunding, what you need to do is you need to be prepared and you need to be prepared. You have to have a good campaign. That, what does that mean? That means that you need to study and evaluate what makes a good campaign a good campaign. It also means that you need to use social media, which is what works very, very well, to expand your message. But it also means that you have to be authentic. And you need to understand, whoops, and you need to understand that chances are that you will fail, fail in the first campaign. And you will learn from that and you will take another campaign. In, the, in terms of crowdfunding then, you need to have two or three backers that would help you improve the message before you put it up. Before you put it up there. 
And as I said, do a test before with your friends. So your friends would share that campaign or that idea with their friends who are the ones who are gonna challenge you because your friends are not gonna challenge you because they love you. The ones that are gonna challenge you are the ones that they don't care on losing your friendship. So those are the ones that are gonna give you the best feedback. Use your banker and start growing that at least. Um, I don't know if you have any questions about angel investors and venture capitalists. I, uh, because I'm in Silicon Valley a lot of, and because I used to, I lived in many countries and I used to come here three or four times a year, a lot of people have contacted me and continuously contact me to see if I can help them find funding. You cannot get funded from an angel investor that lives far away from you. I don't mind what people tell you. That is not true. It just doesn't happen that way. Um, there are exceptions. If you want, yes, Skype was backed by a venture capitalist here. What did they do? They have to move enough. They have to move to an office here. So yes, there are exceptions, but don't don't believe that that's going to happen, um, because that's that's just really really rare. And there's more efficient ways to do that, and you can spin your wheels trying to get there. Um, venture capitalists is the same thing. If you're going to go for venture capitalist, make sure you are prepared. This is like the Olympics of the business. You cannot go into a venture capital fund without being prepared. So how do you find venture capitalists? If you're not prepared to face a venture capitalist, you don't want to find them. Because when you are prepared, you will need to find them. You will need to be very, very prepared to find them. And that's if you're, if you're looking for more than a million dollars. Um, also look for partners. That's, that's another suggestion. Um, I'm going to talk on Tuesday about uh, non-traditional partnerships. Think about coffee and milk. Chances are that if you have a great coffee and you pair up with a manufacturer of great milk, you can do a lot of joint venturing. But it wouldn't be credible to think in the industry of coffee and in the industry of milk. They're complementary industries, but they don't have anything else in common but a product. So you can do that as well. Uh, I will, uh, for those who are on my mailing list, I will send you a link of uh, a new company that they're having a partnership. The company is called Canvas. I just checked it out this morning. And they're partnering with uh, an organization that has the biggest social marketing on Facebook to promote that. So they just save a ton of money on promotion because they're partnering. So that's, again, thinking about resources. You can do that too. Uh, we have just a couple minutes left. I don't know if there's any questions in the group here. Okay. How do you sell passion? Um, and so difficult to find peers. Okay, there are two different questions. Uh, you don't sell passion. passion. Passion inspires people. People are attracted to you because you're passionate about it. And what you do is you let your passion shine through. It, it goes well. If you live in a country where passion doesn't sell, your best supporters are outside of that country. So yes, it's gonna be difficult to find angel investors and venture capitalists, but it's not gonna be difficult to find sponsors and donors. So work on that part. It's so difficult to find peers. There are two types of peers. If you're trying to find co-funders, that is extremely difficult. If you try to find people who are going to support you, establish what I call a community of practice. Join a group where people are inspired. Um, we're gonna do that. We're gonna do what I call the wealth circles. I have done that in different countries and we set up, you can do that with, with people that you know as well. And we set up the time to meet once a month to talk about how we are creating wealth. And we just talk about it. And it gives us a lot of ideas. Just so you can create what is called a community of practice. You can find sponsors and donors in foundations in non-for-profits. And that can help you establish something. Remember that people don't necessarily are driven by money. They're driven by passion. And I'll be happy to help you out. 
that that's something I'm, I'm very passionate about. That's what I do. Another question, you can also find, depending on the country that you live, you can find that the uh, country developers, uh, the countries that do trade, international trade, and the associations are very likely to help you. So you can go to the Association of Software Developers in one country, or you can go to the trade association, you know, um, Australian Fair in Australia, the Nordic uh, Trade Association, Silicon Vikings, uh, Pro Chile in Chile, Pro Peru in Peru. So uh, organizations, government-backed organizations that help companies go global, they could help you out as well and go there. You can also ask your banker. Yes. If you don't know your banker, go to a bank, open a bank account and go and talk to your banker. They know a lot of people. Bankers are good. I like them. Uh, I don't know if local, the question is if local investors will help you move to Silicon Valley. I don't know if local investors will help you move. Um, I will be happy to entertain that. Um, big, I feel my idea needs lots of big names, links, and money. Yes. Big ideas need big supporters. Don't cut yourself short. Go for the big thing that is easier. I'll be happy to help you send me a text message on, on Facebook or, or LinkedIn. Um, you, if you have a big client, um, that is very, very important. So if you want to get, if you want to make something big, um, make a list of your ideal client, make a list of two people who compete with that client and go and talk with those two people before you talk to the, your ideal client. Because those people will tell you what you need to know to improve your message, but just don't be arrogant and show it all. You just go to learn. That's what people don't understand. You go to learn and then you, you thank them for giving you feedback and people will give you more feedback. And then when you go and talk to your ideal client, you're better prepared. Uh, Okay, well, we're just gonna wrap this up. This is great. Thank you so much for being here. Um, let's go and get those ideas out into the world. And uh, I'll put the recording on YouTube. Um, thank you so much. Have a great weekend. You're welcome. Bye. See you on Monday. <laughs>